Stada da seifel creo pavedi kvathshe kveo hillerin vau majad da fogvashe. Stad kvekšerin creo jorediu aniu notavireo. Udn ginerin skveshe darane jerdo edijo skvepa uenge. Ued shekro dabel skveshe himodo uiud kvadn kveo do nijol skvepa. Theo vesau koge to my agere speakers, and to my Sivante speakers podashe hengirith. Since I'm introducing Sivante in this video, I thought it would be best to open with a prayer, as I did with the agere conlang showcase, except this time, it's a different prayer, and it's in Sivante. Even though I wrote the words for the prayer months ago, I feel like it echoes some of the sympathies that we're all feeling at the moment for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. So please, let's continue, if you do pray, to pray and support in whatever way we can. In the last video, we looked at how to plan out our language along its evolutionary journey. Now we're going to delve into the basics of language building by looking at the sounds of a language, also known as its phonology, and various ways you can evolve the phonology of a language. This video will focus on an explanation of some of the basic ideas within phonology, such as the International Phonetic Alphabet, Phonotactics, Phonological Inventories, and Symmetry. In the next video, we'll be looking at phonological change itself as it appears within two types of sound change, syntagmatic sound change, and paradigmatic sound change. If you've watched a few of my videos before, you'll be familiar with some of the languages which I'll be referencing during this video, such as Fidasan, Keornivie, Norasse, and Agere. These belong to the Fidasmau language branch, and in this video I'll be introducing you to the Therekko branch, which consists of Therekke, Sidanse Feor, and Sidanse, which as you can see exists as a contemporary language to Agere. Before we get into the evolution of sound, we need to first understand sound. Phonology is the study of sounds within a language, and these may be broadly split into two groups, phonemes and allophones. Let's use an example. Tai and dai have different meanings, and because ta and da appear in the same position at the start of these words, they can be said to be different sounds. In this case, they are called phonemes. However, if ta appears between vowels in the middle of a word, it can change into a glottal stop, a, uh, butter. However, it's still written and recognized as being ta. A uh, may be said to be an allophone of t. An allophone is the realization of a phoneme which is dependent upon its environment. T has a couple other allophones in English when it comes at the start of a word, in which case it is an aspirated t as in t, or when it follows another consonant and is unaspirated t as in still. Now that we've described this difference, let's move on to the International Phonetic Alphabet, or IPA for short. This is a categorization system used to denote every sound in human speech. We'll begin by looking at vowels. Vowels are made by passing air from the lungs through the oral and nasal cavities without obstructing them. These are formed by moving two articulators, the mouth and tongue, and are influenced by how far towards the front of your mouth it is, or its frontness, how high the tongue is, or its height, and whether the lips are rounded, or its rounding. In this case, the rounded vowel is to the right in each pair. So we would describe E as a high front unrounded vowel and U as a high front rounded vowel, represented here by the Latin Y. Sometimes you'll see high vowels described as close vowels and low vowels described as open vowels. Yes, I pulled these charts from uh, Wikipedia, uh, please don't judge me. Consonants are a bit more complicated because the various appendages within your mouth and nose interact with each other in a variety of complex ways. As a result, consonants are described according to their place of articulation, which describes where they're produced in the mouth, the manner of articulation, which describes how the articulators work with each other at the place of articulation, and voicing, which describes whether the vocal cords are engaged when producing the sound. The voiced sound is to the right, so compare s and z while holding your throat and noticing the vibration of the vocal cords when pronouncing z. If you're unsure what all these terms in the boxes mean, here's a whistle stop tour of each of the terms. Beginning with place, bilabial uses both lips, p. Labiodental uses the teeth and lips, f. Dental, the tongue touches the teeth, f. Alveolar, the tongue touches the alveolar ridge, which is just behind the teeth, s. Postalveolar touches just behind the ridge, sh. Retroflex, the tip of the tongue bends backwards, d. Palatal, the tongue touches the soft palate, ny. Velar, the back of the tongue touches the back of the throat, ch. Uvular is the uvula, that weird dangly bit at the back of your throat, r. Pharyngeal is the pharynx in the throat, h. And finally, glottal is the glottis or vocal cords themselves, h. Turning to manner, plosives, which are also known as stops, are when air builds up and are released in a small explosion, p. Nasals come through the nose, M. Taps are like plosives without the explosion. R. Fun story. As a Scot, you might think I'm just naturally gifted at pronouncing this sound, but I actually learned to make it in the bathroom one night by saying the word butter in an Australian accent. So if you can't make the R sound, 
give that a go. Trills are continuous taps, r. Fricatives are where a gap is left and friction is produced between articulators, s. Laterals are produced when air goes around the sides of the tongue, l. Also, you have lateral fricatives, sh. Approximants or glides are halfway between vowels and consonants, like y. There are, of course, other sounds which can be produced, such as engaging the nasal cavity when making nasal vowels, uh, or constricting your glottis to produce glottal or ejective consonants, t. Uh. If those further examples interest you, I suggest you become quite familiar with the IPA more widely as it can help to diversify your conlang's phonology. Now let's look at phonological symmetry. Typically phonological inventories, which are the collections of all the phonemes within a language, are symmetrical, which means that they have sounds evenly distributed within the sound space across place, manner and voicing for consonants, and similarly across height, frontness and roundness for vowels. Here we see that classical Arabic has three vowels, one front, one central, one back, it's so symmetrical that we can draw a triangle to show how each sound is equidistant from the others in the vowel space. Let's have a look at Spanish, which maintains this equidistance, but with two additional vowels, A and O. So in addition to having the high and low vowels, you also have a mid-vowel category. French maintains this equidistance also, adding five vowels, one front unrounded, one central, and one back rounded. The system isn't entirely complementary because the back rounded vowels don't have unrounded equivalents, but there is symmetry of front rounded vowels such that for each front unrounded vowel, there is a complementary rounded vowel. However, not every language has to have such a uniform system. You can see here that English typically has nasals, plosives, fricatives, and approximants in labial, alveolar, postalveolar, and velar places of articulation. There are fricatives, both voiceless and voiced for labial, dental, alveolar, and postalveolar positions. However, there are a few notable sounds missing from these otherwise symmetrical series, which are indicated here by the red circles, as well as a couple outlying sounds which are circled in orange. Let's see how this plays out within a conline. The phonological inventory of Berazne Feor has this generally symmetrical style for consonants, which fall into three types of plosives along with fricatives and nasals across four places of articulation with a few noticeable gaps and outliers. It uses a completely symmetrical three vowel system, and for every short vowel, there is a complementary long vowel, indicated here by what looks like a colon after each of the vowels. If you want to get a bit more specific though, technically w and y aren't outliers because they are the approximate equivalents of u and e. So because you have the vowels u and e, it makes sense to also have the approximants w and y. As a language evolves, it will gain and lose sounds. As a result, the symmetry in its inventories will evolve. Aguere and Sidanse have undergone significant changes and neither is completely symmetrical, but the languages have evolved to maintain generally symmetrical phonemic inventories. Consider this as a guideline. Your language's phonology is always balancing on a tightrope. It might get wobbly, but generally it stays up. Or in phonological terms, it's always maintaining something of a symmetry even if it isn't exact. The same is also true of the vowels across these languages where Aguere has added to the three vowel system with high mid vowels, and Sidante has gotten rid of its central vowels and instead added in low mid vowels, along with a couple front rounded vowels. If the speech sounds are the building blocks, then the phonotactics is the shape of those blocks. How you choose to put these sounds together will influence the overall sound of the language. A group of sounds considered as a unit is called a syllable, and every language will have constraints on the kinds of syllables which can be formed from the sounds within the phonological inventory. Generally speaking, all syllables contain a vowel, and if this is the only only rule for making a syllable, then you could have a language made up of a word like awi with three syllables. Extending this to a sentence, we could have something like awi iau uai. As you can see, a language which has syllables which can only be composed of vowels is going to produce some weird results. So let's add a little complexity to the syllable structure. Let's add some mandatory consonants and make sure that they always come first in the syllable. Pakuti tipago kusahi. This consonant vowel pattern, or CV pattern for short, is common across world languages. Let's continue to add complexity to this. What if you make consonants optional so that words can begin with just vowels? In this case, optional sounds are put in brackets. We then have something like akuti upago kusahi. Let's now make consonants optional at the end of the syllable as well, so we can introduce some consonant clusters and double consonants. Akurti umpago kusaki. If consonants can group together, maybe vowels can too. Akuarti umpago kusaki. It might even be possible for words to begin with multiple consonants. Akuarti umpago kusaki. Some sounds might not be allowed at the end of words. For example, if e and u change to e and o, 
aquarteumpaigooksakio. I usually refer to the set of consonants or vowels which can only appear at the end of the word as z after a backslash, where the backslash marks the end of a word rather than the end of a syllable. And let's also do the same thing to the start of words as well, and alter which consonant clusters can begin each word. Aquarteumpaigooksakio. We can see how different these all sound. Think of your syllable structure as key to the aesthetic feel of your language. My advice would be to start off simple and work your way up. As you can see here, Birazne Feor has a fairly simple CVD syllable structure. C represents the consonants which can appear in the onset, V represents the vowels which can appear in the nucleus, and D represents the specific constraints at the end of a syllable. I've also indicated that stress in Birazne Feor always falls on the first syllable. The fairly simple CVD syllable structure has given rise to far more complex and different systems in Aguere and Sivance. There are a couple easy ways to vary the syllable structure within your languages over time. We can see here that in Fereke, unstressed vowels at the beginning of a word were lost. So salapa became slapa, which became zlapa. A similar thing happened in Norase, except to unstressed vowels at the end of a word, so keore became keor. The other thing you could do is to change the syllable boundaries. So for example, sivance, z became r when at the end of a syllable, and in agere, a and e both became e before the end of a syllable. So what does it mean for a syllable to be stressed? Stress is the relative difference in loudness or pitch between one syllable and the syllable next to it. Stress can be phonemic, in which case it differentiates between different kinds of words. So for example, the noun compound has stress on the first syllable, whereas the verb compound has stress on the second syllable. In this case, stress is determined word by word and there's no way of predicting where it will fall if you're introduced to a new word. This isn't the case in languages like Finnish, which are non-phonemic, in which case stress will always come on the first syllable of every word. Alusa loi yumala taivan yaman. Stress can also be prosodic, depending on which word in a sentence you want to give emphasis to. For example, if you ask who gave Mary the present, you would say John gave Mary the present, as opposed to someone else. If you asked who John gave the present to, you might say John gave Mary the present to emphasize it was Mary rather than another person. And if you ask what John gave Mary, you would say John gave Mary the present, as opposed to something else. There's also a difference between stress and tone accent. For example, in English, stress is always achieved by making the syllable, which is to be stressed louder than the one next to it, come and take Take them. In this case, this is a translation of the words attributed to Leonidas at the Battle of Thermopylae. The character highlighted in blue has a stress accent, whereas the character highlighted in gold has a pitch accent, which means it has a different pitch relative to the sound in front of it. Molon nabe. If you want more information on Greek accentuation, which is something I find very interesting, I'm going to link to a video in the comments. You also have a difference in timing. If you take the English sentence, John give the present to Mary, and you clap on each stressed syllable, John give the present to Mary, you have a natural rhythm that the sentence follows where every clap and every beat corresponds to the most important words within the sentence. In this case, it's John, present, and Mary. Every syllable that comes in between these most stressed syllables will be shortened to fit that rhythm. However, if you take the same sentence and you translate it into French, it stresses every syllable, which means that every syllable is the same duration. Jean a donné le cadeau à Marie. In this case, we would call French a syllable-timed language, and we would call English a stress-timed language, because the timing in French is dependent upon the syllables. It doesn't matter which of those syllables within the sentence are stressed. However, French does have a difference in tone accent and intonation. Jean a donné le cadeau à Marie. Jean, né, and do receive a higher accent because these are the syllables at the end of what are considered to be the most important segments of the sentence, whereas the final syllable of the sentence, because this isn't a question, will go down. Jean a donné le cadeau à Marie. And that's it for this video. In the next video, we're going to be looking at phonological change as it's affected by both syntagmatic and paradigmatic change. Looking forward to seeing you then.